the four minute men of chicago by the history committee of the four minute men of chicago this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org now that this work has come to its conclusion and the name of the four minute men has become a part of the history of the great war i would not willingly omit my heartfelt testimony to its great value to the country and indeed to civilization as a whole during our period of national trial and triumph from president wilson's farewell letter to the four minute men of america the four minute men the four minute men were a nationwide organization of public speakers under government control during the period of america's participation in the world war although the idea and early plans for the four minute men originated in chicago in the early part of april nineteen seventeen the work officially became a division of the committee on public information on june sixteenth nineteen seventeen when the national headquarters were removed to washington the national organization and all its branches ended official existence on december twenty fourth nineteen eighteen between these dates the four minute men of america numbering about seventy five thousand speakers throughout thirty seven speaking campaigns delivered over seven hundred and fifty thousand speeches to audiences totaling three hundred fifteen million persons the speeches were delivered almost exclusively in the motion picture theaters of the country during four minute intermissions the work was organized in seven thousand four hundred forty eight cities and towns including every state in the union the part of the work done by the four minute men of chicago is the subject and scope of the following pages the four minute men of chicago to chicago belongs the honor of originating the plan for the nationwide organization of public speakers known as the four minute men to chicago also fell the task of working out many of the details of local organization which afterwards became a part of the standard plan for other centers throughout the country this history of the chicago branch of the four minute men is written in part as a souvenir for those who were privileged to take part in the work and in part as a permanent record of a typical unit of a great national organization that attained for itself a place in the history of the united states and its part in the great war one early days the first period of the history of the four minute men extends from the inception of the idea in chicago until the establishment of national headquarters in washington to donald ryerson of chicago belongs the undisputed title of originator of the four minute men he was the first to see the tremendous possibilities of a national organization of public speakers for patriotic service the first to make an experimental four-minute speech in a motion picture theater and the first to assume the burden of establishing such an organization as an instrument of the government for wartime service although the formal declaration of a state of war with germany was not made until april sixth nineteen seventeen when congress met in extraordinary session it was an almost universally accepted opinion for some time prior to that date that war was inevitable diplomatic relations with germany had been severed on february third and the situation was hourly growing more tense during this state of the public mind the urgent need for more adequate military preparedness was the one uppermost subject of thought and conversation the latter part of march with war coming as a moral certainty found every patriotic citizen eager to see his personal line of duty and his opportunity for service to the country the chamberlain bill for universal military training which had been left pending when congress adjourned on march fourth was then in high favor and seemed at that time to represent the best judgment of the nation the imperative need of arousing the public to an appreciation of the tremendous problems involved in preparing for war was evident a group of chicago men at the saddle and cycle club were engaged in an informal after-dinner discussion of the war prospect and the chamberlain bill when the importance of developing public sentiment in favor of the chamberlain bill became the topic 
this discussion brought out the idea of making brief speeches to this effect before picture audiences one of the men was donald m ryerson to whom the idea appealed with special force another was senator medill mccormick who strongly endorsed the idea and did much to strengthen ryerson's determination to make it his work to bring the plan into reality another with whom the idea was discussed that evening was william mccormick blair who promised his support and who afterwards succeeded mr ryerson as national director of the organization another was arthur g cable later decorated for service overseas who gave mr ryerson his immediate and practical assistance in getting the work started the first form the idea took was that of constituting a patriotic committee to send speakers to motion picture theatres to urge upon the public an appreciation of the importance of military preparedness as then provided in the chamberlain bill for universal military training when it was found that four minutes was the limit of available time for speaking during the intermission in most motion picture theatres the name four minute men was adopted carrying with it also a reminder of the patriotic spirit of the minute men of the revolutionary war mr ryerson's first move was to seek the advice and endorsement of representative citizens when he was assured by all with whom he consulted that the idea was sound he made arrangements with the strand theatre of chicago for permission to make a trial four-minute speech this was done on the evening of march thirty first nineteen seventeen on april second mr ryerson invited a group of men to meet for luncheon at the university club where he outlined the need and opportunity for patriotic service and the idea of the four-minute men the meeting ended with a plan of organization agreed upon with the following officers donald m ryerson president stephen gardner treasurer george r jones secretary keith j evans assistant secretary a call for volunteer speakers was issued and some of those present were enrolled for the work a temporary office was established at the university club luncheon meetings were held almost daily and a committee was appointed to arrange a schedule of four-minute talks at motion picture theatres after a number of speeches had been made by the four-minute men on behalf of the chamberlain bill and after war had been declared it became evident that the chamberlain bill which did not meet the wartime emergency was to be dropped and another bill put forward known as the universal selective service and afterwards popularly known as the draft this made it necessary to change the plan of the four minute men the nation was now at war the leadership of the president under the wartime powers granted by the constitution was indisputable and the need of acting only with the approval of the government became a matter of course it was plain that all further talk on the chamberlain bill would be out of order and until congress had enacted a law or the president had outlined a policy for civilian activity it could not be known whether the four-minute men were helping or hindering the plans of the government a meeting of the four-minute men was called on april ninth and the situation laid before them it was the sense of the meeting that mr ryerson should go to washington and lay before the government his plan for a nationwide organization of public speakers under some form of government control accordingly mr ryerson went immediately to washington to see what could be done on april fourteen president wilson had created the committee on public information and it at once became apparent that if the four minute men were to obtain a standing as an agency of the government it must be as a division of this committee mr ryerson interviewed george creel the newly appointed chairman of the committee on public information who in turn secured for the plan the approval of the president and on april twenty mr ryerson telegraphed to his associates in chicago that he had written arrangements with mr creel which placed the four-minute men on an official basis as a division of the committee on public information the control of the organization at first remained vested in the original committee in chicago the first subject universal selective service together with typical arguments to be advanced by speakers 
were approved in washington by mr creel before being released to the speakers it was soon found however that the national headquarters for the work must be established in washington this was done on june sixteen at that time mr ryerson who had previously received a commission in the navy and who had secured a two months leave in order to establish the work of the four minute men relinquished control of the organization william mccormick blair of chicago was then appointed national director of four minute men and took up his residence in washington the responsibilities of national leadership although still vested in chicago men thus passed to washington and chicago thereafter took its rank as one of the local units of the national organization the subsequent history of the four minute men of chicago is that of a unit acting under the general direction of the national headquarters at washington as a division of the committee on public information two the period of service the second period in the history of the four minute men of chicago dates from the reorganization on june sixteenth nineteen seventeen to the conclusion of the work on december twenty fourth nineteen eighteen the chicago members were organized into a local unit and george r jones was appointed chicago chairman by the national director in him was vested all authority and responsibility so far as relations with the national organization were concerned this was in accordance with the standard plan of the national organization each local chairman receiving an official appointment which carried with it the complete authority necessary to the conduct of the work the plan of local organization worked out in chicago included much that was afterwards adopted by the national organization as the standard plan for all local chairmen to follow and also many features that remained peculiar to chicago the authority vested in the chicago chairman was delegated by him to committees covering every branch of the work and the chairmen of all committees together constituted the chicago governing committee all matters of policy affecting the work were discussed and voted upon by the committee although the power to veto necessarily remained with the chairman in order to fulfill his personal responsibilities to the government this plan gave at once the advantage of centralized and unquestioned authority and the wisdom and interest of a large board one of the necessities of the work was that each local unit should be financed by local contributions preferably from a few patriotic persons able to give generously rather than by appeal to the public in view of this plan it was a matter of great service to the four minute men of chicago that samuel insull afterwards chairman of the illinois state council of defense gave the use of offices and equipment in the edison building and later secured for the work the support of the state council of defense the monday luncheon meetings which began with the inception of the work in chicago continued throughout the entire period to be the center and inspiration for four minute men and was largely adopted in other local organizations throughout the country these luncheon meetings were held at first at the grand pacific hotel but later and for the remainder of the period at the morrison hotel the program usually consisted of one or more addresses by speakers of note always on some topic of interest in connection with the war open meetings were also held upon occasion giving any member an opportunity to raise any topic and also giving all an opportunity to hear representative four-minute speeches then being delivered by some of their fellow speakers the various committees met as occasion demanded and called for a great amount of hard work and patriotic sacrifice of time these committees were chicago governing committee composed of the chairman of all other committees advised on all matters of policy admissions committee passed on the qualifications of applicants for membership assignment committee arranged the schedule for speakers and theaters speaking committee visited theaters and reported on the work of individual speakers speakers conference committee assisted individual speakers in perfecting their work theater committee arranged for the cooperation of the theaters program committee arranged the programs for the monday luncheons and other meetings publicity committee 
represented the organization in its relations with the press liberty loan theater committee arranged for speaking in regular theaters during the liberty loan drives committee representing regular theaters advisory committee representing motion picture industry advisory public school committee arranged for speaking at public schools public parks committee arranged for speaking in parks during the summer amusement parks committee arranged for speaking in amusement parks during the summer church section arranged with ministers to use the official bulletins for patriotic talks to their congregations convention section arranged for speaking at various conventions being held in chicago fraternal section arranged for speaking in various secret societies and fraternal meetings labor union section arranged for speaking at labor union meetings wabash avenue section arranged for speaking by colored men to colored audiences for the first year after the work began in chicago george r jones was chicago chairman and also state director for illinois but the work of organizing the four hundred thirty five towns in the state so often required his absence from the city and made such demands on his time that mr jones finally relinquished the active supervision of the chicago branch although continuing to serve as a member of the governing committee he was succeeded by ernest palmer who was appointed chicago chairman on march twenty five nineteen eighteen throughout the remainder of the war period mr palmer was the conspicuous and dominant figure of the organization and the work in chicago owed much of its spirit and success to his exceptional ability and unfailing geniality the topics for speaking were governed by bulletins sent out from national headquarters fixing the period of their use and providing a budget of facts and typical arguments to assist speakers in preparing their speeches thirty-seven of these bulletins were issued each usually representing a new subject although some subjects required two or more bulletins these bulletins were issued in the following order and were used during the period named universal service by selective draft may twelve to twenty one nineteen seventeen first liberty loan may twenty two to june fifteen red cross june eighteen to twenty five food conservation july one to fourteen why we are fighting july twenty third to august five the nation in arms august six to twenty six the importance of speed august nineteen to twenty six what our enemy really is august twenty seven to september twenty three unmasking german propaganda august twenty seven to september twenty three onward to victory september twenty four to october twenty seven second liberty loan october eight to twenty eight food pledge october twenty nine to november four maintaining morals and morale november twelve to twenty five carrying the message november twenty six to december twenty two war savings stamps january two to nineteen nineteen eighteen the shipbuilder january twenty eight to february nine eyes for the navy february eleven to sixteen the danger to democracy february eighteen to march ten lincoln's gettysburg address february twelve the income tax march eleven to sixteen farm and garden march twenty five to thirty president wilson's letter to theaters march thirty one to april five third liberty loan april six to may four second red cross campaign may thirteen to twenty five danger to america may twenty seven to june twelve second war savings campaign june twenty four to twenty eight the meaning of america june twenty nine to july twenty seven mobilizing america's manpower july twenty nine to august seventeen where did you get your facts august twenty six to september seven register september five to twelve fourth liberty loan september twenty eight to october nineteen fire prevention october twenty seven to november two united war work campaign november three to eighteen 
red cross home service december seven what we have won december eight to fourteen red cross christmas roll call december five to twenty three a tribute to the allies december twenty four nineteen eighteen a number of special events of more than ordinary interest to the four minute men were held during the lifetime of the organization of these may be mentioned friday november nine nineteen seventeen get together dinner field day and entertainment at the edgewater golf club december twenty four nineteen seventeen monday luncheon in the ballroom of the morrison hotel guest of honor captain paul perigord special representative of the french government february five nineteen eighteen get together dinner at the stevens building cafe guest of honor donald m ryerson founder of the four minute men may six nineteen eighteen get together dinner at the midday club may twenty nine nineteen eighteen luncheon in honor of one hundred three french blue devils in the ballroom of the morrison hotel which was supplemented by an automobile drive through the city and a reception to the public at the auditorium in the evening under the auspices of the four minute men november eleventh nineteen eighteen armistice celebration luncheon at the morrison hotel guest of honor hon william howard taft songs for the occasion by the liberty chorus november twenty two nineteen eighteen victory dinner in the ballroom of the hotel la salle a festival occasion designed to mark the official close of the work although speaking assignments continued until december twenty four guest of honor william h ingersoll national director of the four minute men december sixteenth nineteen nineteen final monday luncheon farewell address by samuel insall chairman of the state council of defense permanent organization a resolution was passed at the victory dinner at hotel la salle november twenty two nineteen eighteen providing for a permanent organization of the four minute men of chicago as an honorary body to perpetuate the friendships formed during the period of service the incumbent officers were chosen to continue the organization to which were specially added the names of donald m ryerson william mccormick blair and george r jones the chicago governing committee with ernest palmer chairman accepted their further responsibilities under the resolution and elected to their number those who in the past had served as members of this committee it was the sentiment of the members present at the victory dinner that an annual reunion dinner should be provided for the matter being left in the hands of the governing committee facts and figures four minute men of chicago number of speakers enrolled four hundred fifty one workers who served on governing committee forty eight total workers on committees one hundred twenty theaters cooperating three hundred fourteen members who served in army or navy fifty killed in action three speakers in the fraternal section three hundred fifty speakers in the labor section seventy speakers in the church section four hundred ninety reserve speakers forty four number of speaking campaigns thirty seven number of speeches made in chicago fifty thousand total of audiences reached estimated twenty five million monday luncheon meetings held eighty four standing committees twenty president wilson's letters to the four minute men one the white house washington november nine nineteen seventeen to the fifteen thousand four minute men of the united states may i not express my very real interest in the vigorous and intelligent work your organization is doing in connection with the committee on public information it is surely a matter worthy of sincere appreciation that a body of thoughtful citizens with the hearty cooperation of the managers of moving picture theaters are engaged in the presentation and discussion of the purposes and measures of these critical days men and nations are at their worst or at their best in any great struggle the spoken word may light the fires of passion and unreason or it may inspire to highest action and noblest sacrifice a nation of freemen 
upon you four-minute men who are charged with a special duty and enjoy a special privilege in the command of your audiences will rest in a considerable degree the task of arousing and informing the great body of our people so that when the record of these days is complete we shall read page for page with the deeds of army and navy the story of the unity the spirit of sacrifice the unceasing labors the high courage of the men and women at home who hold unbroken the inner lines my best wishes and continuing interest are with you in your work as part of the reserve officer corps in a nation thrice armed because through your efforts it knows better the justice of its cause and the value of what it defends cordially and sincerely yours woodrow wilson two the white house washington november twenty nineteen eighteen to all the four minute men of the committee on public information i have read with real interest the report of your activities and i wish to express my sincere appreciation of the value to the government of your effective and inspiring efforts it is a remarkable record of patriotic accomplishment that an organization of seventy five thousand speakers should have carried on so extensive a work at a cost to the government of little more than one hundred thousand dollars for the eighteen month period less than one dollar yearly on an individual basis each member of your organization in receiving honorable discharge from the service may justly feel a glow of proper pride in the part that he has played in holding fast the inner lines may i say that i personally have always taken the deepest and most sympathetic interest in your work and have noted from time to time the excellent results you have procured for the various departments of the government now that this work has come to its conclusion and the name of the four minute men which i venture to hope will not be used henceforth by any similar organization has become a part of the history of the great war i would not willingly omit my heartfelt testimony to its great value to the country and indeed to civilization as a whole during our period of national trial and triumph i shall always keep in memory the patriotic cooperation and assistance accorded me throughout this period and shall remain deeply and sincerely grateful to all who like yourselves have aided so nobly in the achievement of our aims cordially and sincerely yours woodrow wilson the part of the four minute man i am a four minute man i am the mouthpiece of democracy i make men think i wield the most potent power of human endeavor the spoken word the blind do not read the ignorant cannot read the dullard will not read but all men must hearken to my message my appeal is universal elemental primitive i was a roving shepherd i came back to my tribe and told of a far country green with pastures my message reached abraham he led his tribe forth and founded a great people israel again i was a nomad slave i returned to my people groaning under the fetters of pharaoh and told of a beautiful land beyond the desert my tidings came to the ears of moses and he led his chosen people to the promised land again i was a wandering monk to the high and low i brought the tale of the holy land suffering under moslem oppression my appeal inspired the great crusade again i was a wayfaring mariner spreading strange rumors of unknown lands beyond the seas columbus heard my message set sail and discovered a new world thus it is that the destinies of humanity have been swayed and directed by the spoken word today my appeal is more compelling more potent more universal than ever i am a stoker for the great melting pot in four minutes i breathe the flame of true american patriotism to people of all kinds and creeds i am a soldier i fight german propaganda intrigue falsehoods treachery i am a teacher i set forth in two hundred forty seconds lessons in loyalty duty thrift conservation cooperation i am a herald i sound the clarion call for men to serve their country 
I summon up help for the YMCA and the Red Cross. I am a salesman. I sell liberty bonds and thrift stamps. I am a preacher. Using the text that all men are equal, I invoke loyalty, patriotism, devotion. I am a doctor. I give four-minute treatments for disloyalty, un-Americanism, selfishness, laziness. I eradicate apathy and listlessness, and instill pep and enthusiasm. I am a lawyer. Before a jury of all races and creeds, I indict old-world standards of caste, class distinction, privileges, and false pride. I am an efficiency engineer. I plead for the elimination of waste and carelessness, and the practice of economy and conservation. I am an optimist. I have faith in the triumph of truth and right over might and brute force. I am a prophet. I predict the doom of despotism and autocracy, and the triumph of liberty and democracy. I am a lover. I love the stars and stripes. I love to think that this nation under God is having a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people, shall not perish from the earth. I am the mouthpiece of democracy. I make men think. I am a four-minute man. Note, this composition was awarded a prize offered by the state chairman for Illinois for the best manuscript on The Part of the Four-Minute Man in the War. The author is Fred A. Wirth, one of the four-minute men of Chicago. End of The Four Minute Men of Chicago by The History Committee of the Four Minute Men of Chicago. Harriet Hosmer by Anonymous from Cosmopolitan Art Journal, December 1859. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Born at Watertown, Massachusetts, October 9, 1830, Harriet Hosmer is the only surviving daughter of Dr. Hiram Hosmer, an eminent physician of that place, who, having lost wife and child by consumption, and fearing a like fate for the survivor, gave her horse, dog, gun, and boat, and insisted upon an outdoors life as indispensable to health. A fearless horsewoman, a good shot, an adept in rowing, swimming, diving, and skating, Harriet is a signal instance of what judicious physical training will effect in conquering even hereditary taint of constitution. Willingly, as the active, energetic child acquiesced in her father's wishes, she contrived at the same time to gratify and develop her own peculiar tastes. And many a time and oft, when the worthy doctor may have flattered himself that his darling was an active exercise, she might have been found in a certain clay pit not very far from the paternal residence, making early attempts at modeling horses, dogs, sheep, men, and women, any objects, in short, which attracted her attention. Then, too, both here and subsequently at Lenox, she made good use of her time by studying natural history, and of her gun by securing specimens for herself of the wild creatures of the woods, feathered and furred, dissecting some, and, with her own hands, preparing and stuffing others. The walls of the room devoted to her special use in the old house at home are covered with birds, bats, butterflies, and beetles, snakes, and toads, while sundry bottles of spirits contain subjects carefully dissected and prepared by herself. Full of fun and frolic, numerous anecdotes are told of practical jokes perpetrated to such an excess that Dr. Hosmer, satisfied with the progress toward health and strength his child had made, and having endeavored without success to place her under tuition in daily and weekly schools near home, determined to commit her to the care of Mrs. Sedgwick of Lenox, Massachusetts. Thither the young lady was accordingly sent, with strict injunctions that health should be a paramount consideration, and that the pupil should have liberty to ride and walk, shoot and swim, to her heart's content. In wiser or kinder hands the girl could not have been placed. Here, too, she met with Mrs. Fanny Kemble, whose influence tended to strengthen and develop her already decided tastes and predilections. To Mrs. Kemble, we have heard the young artist gratefully attribute the encouragement which decided her to follow sculpture as a profession, and to devote herself and her life to the pursuit of art. 
In 1850 she left Lennox. Mrs. Sedgwick's judicious treatment and the motive and encouragement supplied by Mrs. Kemble had given the right impetus to that activity of mind and body which needed only guiding and directing into legitimate channels. She returned to her father's house at Watertown to pursue her art studies and to fit herself for the career she had resolved upon following. The life of the young girl was now full of earnest purpose and noble ambition, and the untiring energy and perseverance which distinguish her now in so remarkable a degree were at this time evidenced and developed. Having modelled one or two copies from the antique, she next tried her hand on a portrait bust, then cut Canova's bust of Napoleon in marble, working it entirely with her own hands that she might make herself mistress of the process. Her father, seeing her devoted to her studies, seconded them in every possible way, and proposed to send her to his friend, Dr. McDowell, professor of anatomy to the St. Louis College, that she might go through a course of regular instruction and be thus thoroughly grounded for the branch of art she had chosen. The young artist was but too glad to close with the offer, and in the autumn of 1850 we find her at St. Louis, residing in the family of her favorite schoolmate from Lenox, winning the hearts of all its members by her frank, joyous nature and steady application, and securing in the head of it what she heartily and energetically calls the best friend I ever had. Dr. McDowell, charmed with the talent and earnestness of his pupil, afforded her every facility in his power, giving her the freedom of the college at all times, and occasionally bestowing upon her a private lecture, when she attended to see him prepare dissections for the public ones. Pleasant and encouraging it is to find men of ability and eminence so willing to help a woman when she is willing to help herself. The career of this young artist hitherto has been marked by the warm and generous encouragement of men like Professor McDowell and John Gibson, the sculptor, and pleasant it is to find the affectionate and grateful appreciation of such kindness, converting the temporary tie of master and pupil into the permanent one of tried and valued friendship. Through the winter and spring of 1851, in fact, during the whole term, Harriet Hosmer prosecuted her studies with unremitting zeal and attention, and at the close was presented with a diploma. During her stay at St. Louis, and as a testimony of her gratitude and regard, Miss Hosmer cut from a bust of Professor McDowell by Clevenger a medallion in marble life-size which is now in the museum of the college. It is, perhaps, worthy of note that Clevenger and Powers both studied anatomy under this professor. After graduating, she was determined to see something of the world, and all alone she went to New Orleans, which was thoroughly explored. Returning up the river, she passed on to the falls of St. Anthony, and had many an adventure. The trip added to her good health and spirits. She returned home in the summer of 1851, and immediately set to work to model an ideal bust of Hesper, continuing her anatomical studies, and employing her intervals of leisure and rest in reading, writing, and boating. Now followed a period of earnest work, cheered and inspired by those visions of success, of purpose fulfilled, of high aims realized, which haunt the young and enthusiastic aspirant, and throw a halo round the youthful days of genius, which lends a color to the whole career. To go to Rome, to make herself acquainted with all the treasures of art, ancient and modern, to study and work as the masters of both periods had studied and worked before her, this was now our youthful artist's ambition, and all the while she labored heart and soul at Hesper, the first creation of her genius, watching its growth beneath her hand as a young mother watches step by step the progress of her firstborn, kneading in with the plastic clay all those thousand hopes and fears which, turn by turn, charm and agitate all who aspire. At length, the clay model finished, a block of marble was sought and found and brought home to the shed in the garden hitherto appropriated to dissecting purposes, but now fitted up as a studio. Here, with her own small hands, the youthful maiden, short of stature, and delicate in make, anything but robust in health, with chisel and mallet, blocked out the bust, and subsequently, with rasp and file, finished it to the last degree of manipulative perfection. Months and months it took, and hours and days of quiet toil and patience, but those wings of genius, perseverance, and industry were hers, and love lent zest to the work. 
It was late summer in 1852 before Hesper was fully completed. September 29, 1852, father and daughter sailed for Europe, the St. Louis diploma and Dagra types of Hesper being carefully stowed away in the safest corner of the portmanteau as evidences of what the young artist had already achieved. When arrived at Rome, she should seek the instruction of one of two masters whose fame worldwide could alone satisfy our aspirant's ambition. So eager was her desire to reach Rome that a week only was given to England, when, joining some friends in Paris, the whole party proceeded to Rome, arriving in the Eternal City on the evening of November 12, 1852. Within two days, the daguerreotypes were placed in the hands of Mr. Gibson, as he sat at breakfast in the Café Greco, a famous place of resort for artists. In less than a week, Harriet Hosmer was fairly installed in Mr. Gibson's studio, and where she still is. It is difficult, however, for master and pupil, or we should rather say, for the two friends to part. For, spite of the difference of years, or perhaps in consequence of it, a truly paternal and filial affection has sprung up between the two, a source of great happiness to themselves, and of pleasure and amusement to all who know and value them from the curious likeness yet unlikeness which existed from the first in Miss Hosmer to Mr. Gibson, and which daily intercourse has not tended to lessen. Her first winter in Rome was passed in modelling from the antique, Mr. Gibson desiring to assure himself of the correctness of Miss Hosmer's eye, and the soundness of her knowledge, Hesper evincing the possession of the imaginative and creative power. From the first, Mr. Gibson expressed himself more than satisfied with her power of imitating the roundness and softness of flesh, saying upon one occasion that he had never seen it surpassed and not often equaled. Her first attempt at original design in Rome was a bust of Daphne, quickly succeeded by another of the Medusa, the beautiful Medusa, and a lovely thing it is, faultless in form and intense in its expression of horror and agony, without trenching on the physically painful. We've already spoken of the warm friend Miss Hosmer made for herself, during her winter at St. Louis, in the head of a family at whose house she was a guest. This gentleman, as a godspeed to the young artist on her journey to Rome, sent her, on the eve of departure, an order to a large amount for the first figure she should model, leaving her entirely free to select her own time and subject. A statue of Enone was the result, which is now in the house of Mr. Crow at St. Louis, and which gave such satisfaction to its possessor and his fellow townsmen that an order was forwarded to Miss Hosmer for a statue for the public library at St. Louis, on the same liberal and considerate terms. Beatrice Cenci, which won so many golden opinions from critics and connoisseurs, was in fulfillment of this order. The third summer still found her at Rome. Some little reverses in her father's money matters induced him to suggest the propriety of the daughter's return home for a while and the summons came as she was just on the eve of departure to England, to spend the hot fever months of the Campania. With her characteristic decision, she resolved not to go home and desert her art. The journey to England was immediately given up, and she arranged to remain in Rome during the dangerous season of malaria, to work and earn money as well as reputation. Hitherto, all her wants had been supplied. Now she could not only supply herself, but also help others. The summer passed, and Harriet was spared any illness. She labored with an enthusiasm and energy truly marvelous. The fruit of this labor was the exquisite statue of Puck, one of the most charming and spirited of all compositions. So popular has it become that it has since been repeated several times, the last for the young Prince of Wales, who honored the maiden's studio with a special visit. One copy is also in the possession of the Duke of Hamilton. The original was ordered by and is now in possession of Samuel Hooper, Esquire, of Boston. Puck was followed by the Beatrice Cenci, and a recumbent life-size figure for the monument of a beautiful young woman who died in Rome, and is buried in the church of San Andreo della Fraccio, in the Via Mercede, close upon the Piazza di Spagna. This work has excited great admiration. It is death touchingly rendered, beauty rarely interpreted. This monument was composed while the Cenci was being put into marble. Of the Cenci, we need not speak at length. Its exhibition in this country has served to render the sculptor's name a familiar one, and served to give the American public some idea of her capacity and genius. 
it is a life-size of the unfortunate woman whose terrible tragedy is told so touchingly by shelley and more recently by guarazzi in his novel of beatrice cenci the moment chosen is the night before her execution when overcome by her despair and unmerited fortune she falls upon her couch for sleep the figure reclines upon the bench the limbs dropping to the floor the hair dishevelled the face of suffering yet of a nobility in expression which marks the true woman this statue is now in the st louis mercantile library rooms the property of mr crow the last and greatest of miss hosmer's work is her zenobia which is thus referred to by mrs lydia m child Quote, the statue of zenobia is larger than life size the head is covered with a helmet fashioned like a tiara in the front suggested by a medal of the palmyrene queen in the british museum under this in keeping with the royal costumes of the east is a gemmed fillet the ends of which fall among her curls and meet in a pleasing line the ornamented chinte crossed upon the breast the left hand clutches the chain fastened to her wrist by manacles in the shape of bracelets on the right arm which falls naturally and easily by her side is visible a thin sleeve looped up in amazonian fashion over this first dress is a shorter robe of thicker material the ample folds of a rich mantle fastened on the shoulders with gems breaks up the monotonous outline of the more closely fitting garments the whole costume is a charming combination of grecian grace with oriental magnificence in the position of the feet and limbs the artist seems to me to have accomplished the exceedingly difficult task of making a just poise between action and repose it indicates precisely the slow measured tread natural to a stately person walking in a procession the expression of the beautiful face is admirably conceived it is sad but calm and very proud the expression of a great soul whose regal majesty no misfortune could dethrone miss hosmer in a letter accompanying the photograph writes i have tried to make her too proud to exhibit passion or emotion of any kind not subdued though a prisoner but calm grand and strong within herself i think the public will agree that she has successfully embodied this high ideal of her superb subject End of quote. besides these works miss hosmer has executed several busts medallions etc which are marked by many excellencies among them may be named bust of the lady of lewis cass jr medallion of dr mcdowell of st louis medallion head of lady constance talbot etc she has in model a companion piece to puck in the willow o the wisp said to exceed even the puck in its spirit grace and power of expression miss hosmer visited america in the summer of eighteen fifty eight after the completion and shipment hence of her chenchi her reception was indeed cordial in new york she was a guest of rev dr bellows who gave through frank leslie's illustrated newspaper a good sketch of her life and labors she is now in rome still in her gibson's studio which has been enlarged for her purposes and should her life and health be spared the public have great reason to expect from her hands works which will not fail to render her renowned and give her position with the most eminent of modern sculptors the portrait prefixed to this sketch is furnished us by dr hosmer and is therefore perfectly authentic it is from a photograph taken in rome the lady is in her studio costume with her tools in her hand and a statue at her side we have succeeded in giving a good reproduction of her figure end of harriet hosmer by anonymous recorded by colleen mcmahon The Laws of Shotoku Taishi. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Laws of Shotoku Taishi. 1. Harmony shall be esteemed and obedience shall be held in regard. Because dissensions prevail, therefore men are often unfaithful to their prince and disobedient to their fathers let adjoining districts be left in peace thus harmony between superior and inferior shall be cultivated and cooperation in matters of state shall be promoted and thus the right reason of all things may be reached 
and the right thing accomplished. 2. Let bountiful honour be always paid to the three precious elements of Buddhism, that is, to its priests, its ritual, and its founder. It is the highest religion in the universe, and all people in all generations must pay becoming reverence to its doctrines. Do not harshly censor men's wickedness, but teach them faithfully until they yield obedience. Unless men rely upon Buddhism, there is no way to convert them from the wrong to the right. 3. To the commands of the emperor, men must be duly obedient. The prince must be looked upon as the heaven and its subjects as the earth. The earth contains all things, and the heaven stretches over it. The four seasons pass orderly along, and the spirit of the universe is harmonious. If the earth were to cover the heaven, the effect would be distraction. Hence the prince must command and the subject obey, superiors must act and inferiors yield. Men ought therefore to pay due heed to the orders of the emperor, if not they will bring ruin on themselves. 4. Politeness must be the chief rule of conduct for all officers and their colleagues in the court. The first principle governing subjects must be politeness. When superiors are not polite, then inferiors will not keep in the right. When inferiors are not polite, their conduct degenerates into crime. When both prince and subjects are polite, then social order is never disturbed, and the state is kept in a condition of tranquillity. 5. Covetousness and rapacity must be expelled from the hearts of officers, and they must adjudicate with just discrimination in all suits that come before them. Even in a single day there are thousands of such suits, and in the course of years how great must be the accumulation! If the suit is won through bribery, then the poor man can obtain no justice, but only the rich. The poor man will have no sure place of dependence, and subjects will be driven to abandon their duty. 6. To punish vice and to encourage virtue is the rule in good ancient law. The virtuous man must therefore be promoted, and the vicious man must be surely punished. The man who is untruthful is a powerful instrument to endanger the state and a keen weapon to destroy the nation. The flatterer loves to tell the faults of the inferior to the superior, and also to disclose the errors of the superior to the inferior. Such men are alike unfaithful to the prince and unfriendly to fellow citizens, and in the end fail not to stir up social disorder. 7. The duty of men in the government must be assigned according to their capacity. When intelligent men take service, the applause of the people follows, but when bad men are in office, calamities ensue. If wise officers are put on duty, the matters of state are well managed, and the community is free from danger and prosperity prevails. Therefore, in ancient times the wise king never selected the office for the man, but always selected the man to suit the office. 8. Too often officers and their colleagues come early to their offices and retire soon, so that the public work accomplished in a single day is small. It is incumbent on them to devote sufficient time to their tasks, if not, then the work of the government cannot be done. 9. Everything must be faithfully done, because fidelity is the origin of justice. The distinction between good and bad, between success and failure, depends on fidelity. When both prince and subjects are faithful, then there are no duties which cannot be accomplished, but when both are unfaithful, nothing can be done. 10. Give up all thoughts of indignation, and be not angered with others on account of a disagreement of opinion. 
each one may have a different point of view and may therefore come to a different conclusion if the one side be right then the other must be wrong or the cases may be just reversed it would be unjust to set down one man as surely wise and another as positively stupid because men cannot attain perfection in their characters it is impossible to decide either side to be perfectly right or perfectly wrong while you are angry with another who has a different view from you you cannot be sure lest you be in the wrong therefore though you may think yourself in the right it is safer to follow the opinions of the many eleven let merit and demerit be carefully considered and let rewards and punishments be meted out accordingly in times past this has often failed to be justly done it is incumbent on all who are entrusted with the direction of public affairs and on all officers of the government to look carefully after the distribution of rewards and punishments twelve governors of provinces and their deputies must be careful not to impose too heavy duties on their subjects one state never has more than one prince and in like manner the subjects cannot have more than one master the prince is the head of all his dominions and of all his subjects the officers of government are also the subjects of the prince and there is no reason why they should dare to lay undue burdens upon others who are subjects of the same prince thirteen each officer of the government has his appointed duty sometimes officers complain of the stagnation of business which however is caused by their own absence from their appointed duties they must not make a pretense of the performance of their duties and by their neglect interrupt public affairs fourteen subjects and officers must not be jealous of each other if one person is envious of another the second is sure to be envious of the first thus the evils of jealousy never end if men shall envy each other on account of their talent and wisdom no single wise man would ever be obtained for government service through a thousand years what a noble method of governing a state would that be which expelled from its service all wise men fifteen to sacrifice private interests for the public good is the duty of the subject when men are selfish there must be ill will when ill will comes then with it must come iniquity which will disturb the public welfare ill will is sure to bring about the breaking of wholesome rules and the violation of the laws of the state it is for this reason that the harmony between superior and inferior spoken of in the first article is so important sixteen to select a convenient season in which to employ men for public work is the rule of good ancient law winter is a time of leisure but during the season between spring and autumn in which they are employed on their farms and in feeding silkworms it is not expedient to take men from their work or interfere with them in their efforts to supply food and clothing seventeen important matters should only be settled after due conference with many men trifling matters may be decided without conference because they are not so material in their effects but weighty matters on account of their far-reaching consequences must be discussed with many counsellors it is thus that the right way shall be found and pursued end of the laws of shotoku taishi natural man by arthur b moss this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Natural Man by Arthur B. Moss Concerning the when and how of the origin of man, nothing positive is known. Genesis states that God made man, 
but as the greatest intellects of modern times doubt the existence of deity a ready acceptance of the mosaic account of the creation of the human species can only take place among those who are not well qualified to weigh evidence balance probabilities and appraise the evidence of rival theories the researches of men of science lead us to the belief that the authors of the first and second chapters of genesis were mistaken they formulated a theory and imagined it to be a fact darwin heckel huxley and other eminent scientists dispute altogether the theory that man was created perfect and in their works have proved to demonstration that the beings called men have evolved from lower organisms that they have the same anatomical structure as the catarrhini apes that there is a distinct blood relationship between them and that they have both had a common parentage to establish the truth of the evolution theory it is enough to look fairly at the facts of nature to observe man under various aspects to consider him in barbaric times or in countries where he is not yet civilized to see him in a nude condition with nothing to cover him but a mass of hair which nature provides to watch him in his struggle for life with his enemies the destructive lower animals and his fellow men and to find in the course of years that a higher form of man has evolved out of this barbaric creature the evolution theory accounts for the facts as they are observed in life facts which upon any other theory are quite inexplicable and it must not be supposed that because the theory does not give a complete explanation to all the phenomena that it therefore is not reliable heckel says pedigree of man page thirty six if we can only prove the general truth of the darwinian theory our idea of the origin of man from lower vertebrata follows of necessity and we are not obliged to give a special proof as to this latter view if the general proposition is well established that the general proposition is well established is now admitted by the most enlightened of the opponents of darwinism what is called the evolution theory is generally acknowledged to be removed from the region of hypothesis to that of fact but it is not my purpose further to pursue the subject of man's origin which while it is confessedly a most interesting question is one upon which no man who is not a skilled scientist can write or speak with authority i can only deal with probabilities nobody so far as we know was present to witness the first man spring into existence indeed we do not know that there was a first man and if there was a first it does not follow that he was conscious of being made or when he was completed that he had the pleasure of seeing his maker who told him how it was done or on the other hand if he were evolved from some lower creature it does not follow that he was conscious of the evolution but at least we can be sure that history speaks with no uncertain sound concerning man's progress in the world and the means by which it was achieved as a civilized creature man is not many centuries old even now we find many savage races existing on the earth and in type so low in the scale are they that they more nearly resemble the brute beasts both in intellect and in physique than the higher forms of men now if we would study the progress of the human race to any advantage we must study it apart from all prejudice and not allow religious or superstitious notions concerning the superiority of one class of people to warp our minds and prevent us from understanding the important part played by savage peoples in the battle of life for it must always be remembered that man's history is one of fearful warfare not only between men and men but between man and the lower animals it is no flight of the imagination to say that there exist the clearest proofs that man many ages ago lived in holes in the earth and went in constant fear of animals who sought him as their prey sometimes he would have to scramble up trees to elude the vigilance of these sagacious beasts sometimes the tree would form no place of safety 
and he would have to run for dear life or become a living sacrifice to these savage beings. In the course of time man learnt how to keep himself warm, while the beasts of the field perished from cold or parched with thirst and famished with hunger, sunk and died. He learned how to huddle himself up close to a fire in his mud hut, out of all danger from the enemy. In addition to this he learnt how to speak, to communicate his thoughts to his fellows. There were great steps in advance. Man was still in a nude condition, but now he began to form a theory as to the cause of the phenomena of the universe. He began to establish the reign of the gods. All his gods, naturally enough, at first were fetishes. Those animals which he considered superior to himself he elected as special objects of worship. As soon as he found that these were not superior, but inferior, to himself, he began to make gods after his own image. Out of the small tribes in course of ages grew great nations. Men could now manufacture weapons of destruction with which they could procure food and destroy their enemies. Thus little by little were built up the nations of the earth. All advance, all progress toward civilization made by primitive man was made by opposing with all his strength and skill the destructive forces of nature, and by strenuous attempts at improving upon human nature itself. Was man then inherently depraved and prone to evil continually? Not so. The germs of evil and good were alike sown in his nature, and if either of these was developed by favorable circumstances, an evil or a good result followed of necessity. That man was not depraved by nature is seen by the fact that in the general evolution of things, instead of growing worse, he has continued to improve from the low, brutal, and immoral creature of the past to the purer, loftier, nobler being, the highest that can be found today. In his natural state, it is true, man was a wicked being. He had no intuitive knowledge of right and wrong. He had to perform an act, and he was never sure until he felt the results whether it was good or bad. In his natural state he was dirty, untruthful, unjust. No god came to tell him that cleanliness was next to godliness, nor admonish him to be truthful and just in all his dealings. He was left alone to use his own unaided intelligence as best he might. To test the truth of these assertions, one has only to turn to savage races existing today. It will be found on investigation that not only are they unclean in their habits and destitute of any idea of justice, but for the most part they are unblushing liars and ingenious thieves. All the characteristics in human nature that are called virtues are purely of artificial growth and result from man's cultivation of his better self, or, in other words, from his improvement upon nature's spontaneous course of action. In support of this view, I may here quote J. S. Mill, who says, Essays on Nature, page 48, Children and the lower classes of most countries seem to be actually fond of dirt. The vast majority of the human race are indifferent to it. Whole nations of otherwise civilized and cultivated human beings tolerate it in some of its worst forms and only a very small minority are consistently offended by it. Indeed, the universal law of the subject appears to be that uncleanliness offends only those to whom it is unfamiliar, so that those who have lived in so artificial a state as to be unused to it in any form are the sole persons whom it disgusts in all forms. Of all virtues this is the most evidently not instinctive, but a triumph over instinct. Assuredly, neither cleanliness nor the love of cleanliness is natural to man, but only the capacity of acquiring a love of cleanliness. On page 57, the same writer declares that, Savages are always liars. They have not the faintest notion of truth as a virtue. Having then all these bad qualities of nature, 
how is it that man has been able to put them into subjection and advance along the road to civilization even at the pace that we have seen such advance has been wholly dependent upon the energy and skill with which he has opposed the destructive forces of nature using one law to counteract another and upon the determination with which he has striven to improve upon human nature itself for centuries man groped about in the dark nature was deaf to his appeals and blind to his sufferings and her daily performances frightened and bewildered him and yet he did his best to ascertain the causes of the phenomena of the universe but his best guesses were wide of the mark outside of nature he sought for explanation he thought he had scaled nature's heights and fathomed her debts when he had merely gazed a few miles into the vast expanse of space above and when the most learned among them declared that god was the author of the universe a great theological enterprise commenced every nation started a god on its own account and if one proved to be insufficient a few more were easily drafted in with a devil to keep them company these gods and devils which were material or spiritual according as occasion required were hereafter put forward as explanations of nature's workings and the people believed in them how could they do otherwise their credulity was perfectly natural they could not investigate all their faculties were untrained even the most learned among them were superlatively ignorant incapable by virtue of an untrained mind of accurately perceiving recording remembering or judging of nature's manifold manifestations and so the theologian has a good time of it he believed thoroughly in his own pretensions believed that he possessed the key which opened the door of all mysteries that he was a god-appointed teacher of men and in all the countries of the world he was looked upon as second only in importance to the gods themselves but all this time the people were anxious to know not only what sort of deity it was they worshipped but what kind of action would be likely to win his favor they were told that god was a jealous being and that their first duty was obedience to his will they believed it when therefore they were instructed to slaughter their neighbors who worshipped a different deity they went to the task with all the ardor of their nature imagining in their ignorance that the more brutally they executed the deity's will the more pleasantly would he smile upon them the jews killed the midianites the amalekites the baalites and all other peoples they were capable of mastering who despised their god later the mohammedans with equal mercilessness followed the example of their jewish brethren later still the christians persecuted and murdered many who stubbornly refused to acknowledge that jesus was the christ and each nation could not only refer the deed back to the priest from whom the wicked instructions came but the priest in his turn could point to the passage in his sacred book distinctly commanding or sanctioning such barbarities the bible contained instructions for the jews not only to kill unbelieving people of other nations but minute details were given as to how believers of their own kith and kin should be put to death leviticus twenty four sixteen the koran was equally explicit in its directions to murder the infidels chapter on the cow page twenty three and the new testament which the christians accepted as a guide not only bade the believers have no fellowship with unbelievers but into whatever city they went and the people were indisposed to give heed to their preachings they were to shake off the dust of their feet and god would make it warmer for such people in the next world than for ordinary sinners nay more the christian could point to the strong declaration of jesus but those mine enemies who would not say that i should reign over them bring hither and slay before me luke nineteen twenty seven the people were told that angels existed they believed it they were told that witches were displeasing to the sight of god 
that he had given instructions that they were not to be suffered to live. They believed it, and did their best to remove the witches from the face of the earth. They were told that their god liked nothing so much as roast lamb. They believed it, and when they couldn't spare a lamb, they thought it would be pleasant at least for their deity to smell the flavor of it. They were told that God was the father of all men, that he was just and good, but that he liked some nations better than others, and considered some men fit only to be the slaves of others. They believed it. They were told that God made man. They believed it. They were told that he made all other animals for man's pleasure and assistance. They believed it. They were told that he made the sun and the stars to give light to the earth. They believed it. They were told that he made the earth. They believed it. That it was flat, and they were flats enough to believe that also. But they were not told who made God. What intelligent mind designed him before he was made? Who made the intelligent mind that designed the God that made the world out of nothing? These matters were allowed to remain impenetrable mysteries. In course of time, morality improved. The would-be murderer found that there were men in the nation who could defend themselves against all assaults of the enemy, and that the only way to be secure from attack was to promise not to be the aggressive party. And the thief found that if he stole, others would steal from him that only by being honest could he hope to have his own property protected. Though very early in the progress of man laws had been made against murder and theft, it was not until men saw that their own life and property were at stake, and that unless they were peaceful and honest themselves, they ran a risk of losing all they had, that anything approaching harmony existed among the people of the nations that were on the high road to civilization. Among savage races, murder, theft, and other crimes are almost as rife as ever, and it is only when barbarous races come in contact with races higher up the scale of life that their morality manifests rapid improvement. Skepticism is the sign of a healthy mind. Doubt and unbelief invariably arise as the result of earnest inquiry and vigorous thought except among the philosophical greeks and cultured romans doubts concerning the truth of theology were not openly expressed even by the few until many centuries after the christian era began of course among the early christians there were many who doubted some who denied the divinity of jesus many who questioned the truth of the resurrection among the brahmins and buddhists many who were skeptical on dogmatic points of their faith. But it was not until the middle of the sixteenth century that we find men questioning the pretensions of theologians and exposing with admirable fearlessness and candor the errors of theology. Martin Luther, early in the sixteenth century, boldly questioned the dogmas of the Romish Church. He was ably supported by Philip Melanchthon, but these reformers, although fighting bravely for the right of free thought, were fearful lest others in the exercise of this freedom should go further than they did. Bruno, Telesio, Campanella, and Vanini are among the first mentioned in history who courageously declared their disbelief in the prevailing theology. Bruno was a pantheist. He denied that God was a person and declared that he was an essence. He affirmed that matter was indestructible, that nature produced all phenomena as the fruit of her own womb. He believed in the plurality of worlds, and denied the teaching of Aristotle. Telesio and Campanella held much the same belief. Vanini was an atheist. For their heresies, Telesio and Campanella were imprisoned. Bruno and Vanini both died at the stake. No doubt there were many others who entertained doubts similar to those expressed by these noble philosophers, but when they found that their skepticism would be burnt out of them if they expressed it, they doubtlessly came to the conclusion that they had better keep it to themselves until men were more prepared for the reception of it. 
and probably the time would never have come had it not been for the heroism of a bruno the defiance of a venini and the persistent teaching of other less known freethought worthies galileo the astronomer must also be numbered among the skeptics he denied that the earth was the center of the universe and in opposition to such teaching declared that it moved round the sun for making known this now well-established fact the great astronomer was imprisoned and a short interval allowed for him to recant or die the death of an infidel he was an old man and life was sweet he elected to live he had sown the seeds of doubt concerning the church's teaching of astronomy he left it to blossom in its own good time in europe periodical efforts had been made to improve the social and domestic life of the people feudalism having developed to its highest point decayed and upon its ruins were established strong monarchies which vied with each other in voluptuousness and wickedness but if the nation showed any signs of going forward in the march of progress there was always one chain at least to drag them hopelessly back again this was the romish church with its slavish theology and horrible corruption for centuries the popes at intervals had embroiled italy sometimes several popes ruled at once and sometimes the catholic church had no pope at all to unite and maintain the temporal and spiritual power in their own persons was ever the ruling passion of the catholic potentates and for this they have split rivers of human blood under their absolute power the church and its vices has grown up for centuries rooted into the heart of society the people had learnt to revere the ancient institution their imaginations were captivated by its showy services its priesthood had the keeping of their consciences was their only means of access to heaven gave consolation in sickness married buried and sent them to paradise its superstitions and centuries of cruelty had as yet only increased its power europe was filled with its images of saints and martyrs real or counterfeit and the people were instructed to fall down and worship them dead saints were made the medium of access to the deity the services of religion were muttered in dead languages priests were decked in dazzling garments wax candles burnt in the churches at noonday vessels of gold and silver stood on the altars preaching had become rare and had degenerated into frivolous talking monks who lived a life of ease or idleness and often of vice were scattered in multitudes throughout every nation of christendom and in order to prevent inquiry and crush opposition the inquisition was established and the fire of persecution lit pope alexander the sixth a man of unusual depravity burnt savonarola for preaching reform in the church in short a frightful spiritual despotism such as europe had never seen before held the human mind in abject bondage dr bollock's history of modern europe page twenty three after the reformation the disputes between christians regarding the doctrines of the protestant as well as the catholic church were numerous and exceedingly bitter but the masses of the people having to work hard for a small pittance and little leisure took comparatively small notice of these theological disputes and applied themselves with commendable zeal to more useful labor than watching the wretched encounters of fanatical religionists the printing press having now got into working order began to disturb the peace of mind of the clergy and others in authority every shot from the armory of intelligence shook to their foundation the dogmas of the church the people continued to work scientific men too continued their labors quietly columbus discovered america and frightened credulous believers in the flatness of the earth out of all the wits they ever had descartes in france spinoza in holland formulated a philosophy that knocked the anthropomorphic deity of the christians quite off its pedestal 
it was done however in such a learned manner that the common people heard scarcely anything about it these continued the useful labors of the world they tilled the soil they bred cattle they erected magnificent houses for the rich and small hovels for the poor they made gaudy raiment wherewith to bedeck the persons of kings and priests and plain dresses as a covering for the common people periodically their progress was thwarted by being called upon to fight religious wars for the priests and wars for the glorification or vanity of kings running rapidly over the pages of history one important fact stands prominently out it is this that as soon as the nations were at peace for however short a while the skeptics appeared again and with the growing intelligence of the people spoke in language of unmistakable plainness about religion thomas paine directed his powerful intellect against the upas tree voltaire's wit went like a javelin to its core while mirabeau and dolbach tore off the mask and left theology's errors exposed in all their glaring hideousness and now the dawn of a new era for free thought began to appear the clergy maligned great skeptics but skepticism increased notwithstanding heretical works were condemned and the authors imprisoned but the seeds of doubt having been widely sown nothing short of the wholesale destruction of persons suspected of entertaining these doubts was likely to prove effectual in the extirpation of them from this point rapid progress towards the higher civilization was made in all countries in europe where the people were bold enough to free themselves from the dogmatism of the priests read the works of scientific men take advantage of every new discovery interest themselves in the political and social movements of the country in short man advanced in proportion as he devoted himself to the work of the world and left the next world and all opinions in regard to it to take care of themselves so far we have seen the progress of man has been won by a vigorous struggling against the harmful forces of nature in truth nature has been a very useful servant to those who understand her but a harsh and brutal master to those who are ignorant of her ways she is not nor ever has been worthy of worship she destroys every being that lives once and sometimes by the most painful process it is possible to conceive how many thousands she has starved with hunger frozen with cold poisoned drowned or swept away by earthquakes or other frightful calamities mankind will never know all we can know is that thousands have been thus sacrificed and that in proportion as man used one force of nature to counteract the effects of another he has advanced when the skeptical man had a chance of life his advance toward civilization was rapid the skeptical mind investigated new discoveries were made the printing press increased in usefulness and power new forms of industry were started and a higher happiness made possible for the masses of the people the art of agriculture steadily improved and the shipping of merchandise from one nation to another was greatly facilitated by improved skill in navigation great however as were the strides toward civilization in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries they were all eclipsed in the early part of the nineteenth century by the utilization of steam power electricity and other great natural forces which had the effect of greatly increasing the wealth producing power of those nations that adopted them nor was this all for immediately following machinery which saved an enormous amount of labor was introduced food and clothing became cheaper the people multiplied rapidly and with this increase of population grew a proportionate demand for food and labor in a short time the struggle for existence was manifestly keener than it had ever been before the rich became richer and richer while among the poor the tendency was to get poorer and more poor uncomplainingly the people devoted themselves to the labor of each day 
theology they set aside for six days of the week and concerned themselves about the gods on sunday though they did not often say so the majority of men thought it was far better for them to be diligent workmen performing all the secular duties of daily life building houses making clothes machinery writing books acting the part of good husbands fathers or citizens than to have the most orthodox belief it was possible for a being to entertain and this sentiment grew stronger and stronger and proved of immense importance to mankind for hundreds of years theologians had talked about the importance of saving men's souls and those who possessed the smallest seemed to make the most fuss about them but now the aspect of things was changed men began to talk about looking after their bodies and some ventured to suggest that if they had souls in their bodies it would perhaps be no disadvantage to them if their bodies were well fed well clothed and their whole being well trained necessity forced all but a small minority into the labor market and after years of labor the earth was converted from a howling wilderness into a home fit for habitation here let me distinctly affirm that all that is admirable in civilized life the comfort of home the pleasure of education the fascination of the drama the beauty of painting or sculpture the usefulness of scientific acquirements owe their value to the secular labor of mankind theology deserves no credit in respect to these things theology did not help man to supersede the sailing vessel by the steamship the old coach by the railroad the reaping machine by the scythe vice versa d w nor the fastest locomotion by the telegraph wires the theologian did not discover the telephone nor did he learn how to light with a brilliancy previously unknown to man our streets and great public buildings by means of electricity one stevenson is worth a thousand theologians one edison of more value to the world than all the gods that men's imagination have ever pictured but see what additional wonders the secular laborer has accomplished he has removed forests of trees and converted them into houses the hides of cattle he turned into boots and shoes the wool of sheep he has transformed into robes of beauty and utility he has bedecked our walls with paintings put books upon our shelves and with sweet music gladdened our hearts to accomplish all this he has had to rely solely upon his reason yet theologians call this splendid attribute carnal reason and declare that it is no safe guide to man it has been man's only guide and when he has trusted it he has been more often in the right than otherwise even his errors have assisted him in future labors faith he has had but it has always been secular faith experience has been his guide science a lamp unto his feet even when he has walked down the wrong path he has done so with his eyes open theological faith is sightless it allures you to the brink of a precipice and precipitates you to the earth beneath it is a ship without a rudder the tempestuous waves toss it about recklessly the wind drives it savagely against the rocks and today this ship called theological faith is a dreary wreck but reason grows stronger and clearer as the ages roll on man has discovered that he can trust it that he can use it that he can assist himself and others by the employment of it in other words he can do his own thinking reason out his own principles act his own life he can be a man and it is better for an individual to be a bad original than a good copy of somebody else man is civilized today he has fought a good fight he has conquered a foe but better than all he has converted an enemy into a friend what is man's future policy is there not still plenty of labor for him to perform is there not an ocean of enigmas yet to be fathomed a gold mine of knowledge yet to be explored 
Is there not poverty to be remedied, pain to be alleviated, ignorance to be removed? The reformer has yet something to inspire his fervid soul, the philanthropist plenty to touch his generous heart. Why, even now the wealthy rogue struts pompously upon the stage of life in grand attire and flares sumptuously every day, while honest poverty in rags lies hungry and fainting at his door. Even now the rich own all the land, and many poor have not where to lay their head. Even now all men are not equal in the sight of the law, and one man gets pensioned for work for which another is incarcerated in jail. Even now our sisters are outraged and turned adrift upon the world to be the playthings of vicious men forevermore. Even now our workhouses are filled with men and women who are able to work for an honest living, if they could get it, but cannot because labor is cheap and there are too many waiting to perform it. Even now our jails are filled with society-made criminals, that education and better circumstances might have rescued from a life of misery and crime. Even now youth is stunted and starved, and men and women pine away, racked with some terrible disease which thoughtless and careless parents have transmitted to them. Reformers abate not your enthusiasm, but work bravely on. Through the world diffuse the glorious light of knowledge. Let men learn that all crime is a mistake, that effects always follow causes, and that a good effect never follows from a bad cause in a nation that is governed on the principles of truth and justice. Remove poverty by sound advice to the poor and by strenuous efforts to improve men's surroundings. Stay the drunkard in his downward course and assist unceasingly all social and political progress. Popularity you may never attain. Even praise for your unselfish labor may be denied you while you live. But good work must leave its influence in the world, and your children's children will assuredly profit by it. For, as Carlyle truly says, beautiful it is to see and understand that no worth, or known or unknown, can die even on this earth. The work an unknown good man has done is like a hidden vein of water flowing underground, secretly making the ground green. It flows and flows. It joins itself with other veins and veinlets, and one day it will start forth as a visible perennial well. End of Natural Man by Arthur B. Moss Recording by Roger Moline Peter Lombard and the Sacramento System Excerpt by Elizabeth Francis Rogers, 1892-1974 Published in 1917 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 6 Peter Lombard and His Textbook Introduction Manuals which gather knowledge or opinion and present it in orderly form often live longer and sometimes seem to exert an influence far exceeding the works of original genius. Donatus wrote in his Ars Grammatica the rules of composition devised by many, which he alone collected and ordered for common instruction. He had deserved fame as a teacher, to whom Jerome went as a pupil, but the Ars Grammatica became the school book of the Middle Ages, was still in use at the Reformation, while its author's name became a common metonymy in the form donut for a rudimentary treatise of any sort still greater has been the vogue of euclid who in the third century before the christian era produced his elements which in varied forms are still books of instruction for youth in the science of geometry 
Similar to the role played by these two is that of the greatest theological textbook of the Middle Ages, to whose author we have at last come. The Life of Peter Lombard Peter Lombard, the master of the sentences, was born in Lumello, not far from the Novara, which then belonged to Lombardy, probably about 1100. His family, both poor and obscure, was unable to educate the son, and there was small hope for a career in the church until he found a patron in the Bishop of Lucca, who sent him to school at Bologna. The success in his studies achieved there made him wish to go to France, and in this desire again his patron helped him with a letter of recommendation to St. Bernard, abbot of clairvaux bernard at first placed him in the episcopal school at rheims which then enjoyed a great reputation under the headship of le Tauf, where he remained but a short time paris was really the centre of the intellectual movement of the day and it is therefore not surprising that peter wished to go thither bernard who had provided for his needs at rheims now wrote recommending him to Gildun, abbot of St. Victor, for the short stay which he intended to make in Paris. The school of St. Victor was at that time famous for its learning. It was to this abbey that William of Campo had retired in 1108, and with him had come many of his pupils. William was made Bishop of Chalons in 1113, but his successor, Gilduin, elected abbot the following year, maintained the tradition of piety and learning, and to the school came students from all over Europe, of whom perhaps the most famous was Hugh of Blankenburg, better known as Hugh of St. Victor. The Lombard probably came to Paris before 1139, just as Abelard had resumed his career as a teacher there. Probably Peter Lombard heard his lectures, at least he read his books, for John of Cornwall tells us that he frequently had his book in his hands. He also studied Gratian's Decretum, which had just been finished, and it was precisely these two influences, Abelard and Gratian, which most conditioned his later method of exposition. He soon gained the chair of theology at the Cathedral School of Notre Dame, which he filled for many years, and in which he won great and enduring repute. By 1142, his commentary on the epistles of St. Paul had become known. In 1148, he was at Reims with Robert of Moulin, and joined Adam du Petit Pont and Hugh of Reading as opponents of Gilbert de la Porre in theological discussions. He is already well enough known to be consulted by Pope Eugenie the Third, and no greater evidence of the regard in which he was now held could be found. Sometime during the years 1148-1150 he was at Rome, probably on account of the troubles arising in the Paris schools. While there he became acquainted with the work of John of Damascus, the Fountain of Knowledge, which had just been translated by Burgundio of Pisa. This again shows us his interest in the latest publications. His own fertility of mind was matched with a desire to know the thoughts of others. At the beginning of 1152, when his successful teaching at Paris had made his reputation, and when his Libre Sententiarum had just been finished, a bull of Eugene the Third gave him a prebend in the Diocese of Beauvau, again on the recommendation of Bernard of Clairvaux. His teaching had been opposed in some points by Robert of Malun and Maurice of Sully, but Peter endeavored always to keep it orthodox though taking account of all the opinions of the day. He was always circumspect, always deferential to authority, and a friend of peace. His instruction, despite this opposition, was successful, and his pupils, realizing the merit of his lectures, begged him to publish them. 
to this request we owe the celebrated book of sentences in eleven fifty nine the bishopric of paris was vacant by the death of thilbault philip of france fourth brother of king louis the seventh and archdeacon of paris was elected to succeed him he declined but advised the canons to elect peter lombard whose pupil he had been and whose talents and services fitted him for this dignity later in the century walter of st victor accused him of gaining the election by simony but there seems to have been no just ground for this accusation in july eleven sixty peter was succeeded in the bishopric by maurice de soli a master in theology and the builder of the present cathedral of notre dame peter died some time after the date is not known but it cannot have been later than eleven sixty four in the cartulary of paris we find his name mentioned a couple of times the house in which he had lived was given to the church of paris and stephen langton archbishop of canterbury presented the original manuscript of the sentences to the cathedral library for the benefit of poor students it is most surprising that a man whose book has been so widely known should be mentioned so seldom by contemporary historians the lombard's earlier works from the earlier period of peter lombard's life three works have come down to us the commentary on the psalms of david and the commentary on the epistles of st paul and his sermons for the study of the scriptures the middle ages had a number of collections of the comments of the fathers on the several books of the bible in the lombard's time the most celebrated was that of Wilfrid strabo known as the glossa ordinaria written in the ninth century at the beginning of the twelfth century anselm of leon added new notes to this between the lines and his work was known as the glossa interlinearis peter lombard simply used this glossa and composed his commentary almost entirely of citations from augustine cassiodorus the glossa of Alsuin, rabanus morris and others which were included in the glossa following their example he does not entirely give up the literal sense of the passage but always inclines rather to the spiritual and mystical interpretation his commentary on st paul's epistles was written about eleven forty like that on the psalms it is hardly more than a compilation of extracts from the writings of ambrose hilary jerome augustine cassiodorus and remy of auxerre the lombard's sermons are hard to date some are probably from the time of his episcopate others certainly seem to be from the period of his residence with the canons of st victor their pulpit was famous and peter must have preached there the sermons are still unpublished some of the sermons are said to be inferior in style to that of the books of the sentences and would therefore lead us to believe that they were from an earlier period some also show quite strikingly the influence of the strong mysticism of st victor the four books of sentences the book on which peter lombard's fame rests and from which he gained his title of master of sentences was a libri quator sententiarum this was probably written about eleven fifty this date seems to fit with the few facts that we know about his life and with his use of gratian's decretum and john of damascus's fountain of knowledge which peter himself tells us had been translated by order of pope eugene the third from the greek into latin in the prologue to the sentences peter lombard declares that he has gathered the opinions of the fathers into one volume that the students may be saved the handling of a number of books he makes no pretense to originality 
the middle age was a period of codification in all branches of knowledge and the lombard follows a long line of canonists and theologians who had devoted themselves to gathering and codifying the opinions of the fathers and doctors of the church on question of doctrine in the first half of the twelfth century this parallel development of canon law and theology was summed up in two great textbooks gratian's decretum or concordia discordantium canonum and peter lombard's libre quartor sententiarum the legend that made peter and gratian brothers is untrue but it is at least an interesting exposition of the comparison that the middle ages always drew between their two books up to the twelfth century there had been no textbook for the study of theology it is certainly interesting then to see how the lombard systematized the theological teaching of the middle ages into a compendium which became the basis of the instruction in the schools and universities for centuries and the starting point for the work of all catholic theologians in this task peter lombard owed much to the work of his predecessors and especially to the books of his contemporaries which appeared a few years before his own there are only about ten lines in the whole book for which no source can be found abelard had already led the way in the systematizing of theology by his theologia and we can see the widespread influence of this in several books the sentences of peter abelard or the epitome as it is usually erroneously called a collection of abelard's opinions made by some of his pupils the sentences of roland bardinelli later pope alexander the second of omnibini and most important of all those of peter lombard for his method the lombard was more dependent on the model of abelard's sic et non the gathering of authorities in a systematic methodical way for and against a doctrine but unlike abelard he makes some attempt at reconciling the differences between his authorities by subtle distinctions and clever inferences peter states the proposition quotes the authorities on the subject which are often quite contradictory and ends with a few words which show the true conclusion as he sees it he is always timid always modest and some of his conclusions are intentionally stated quite vaguely his humility and modesty are summed up admirably in the rather discouraged words at the end of one distinction if any one can explain this better i am not envious in the arrangement of his book he does not follow abelard's theologia that was divided under the headings faith charity and sacrament peter lombard's division into four books was perhaps taken from john of damascus's fountain of knowledge which he followed quite closely in the first three books in the prologue he says that he will divide the books into chapters with titles what is sought may be found more easily in this arrangement he was influenced by the decretum later in the next century it was divided into distinctions the patristic authorities which the lombard cites in defense of every point in his arguments he found mostly in the sic et non and in gratian's decretum it is probable that the gathering of many of the quotations from the fathers in the sic et non was the fruit of abelard's own reading but certainly there were others in that period who were working at the same task alger of liege had also put together texts from patristic writings in his sentences which were an aid to peter lombard's work and some of which were incorporated in gratian's decretum 
the frequently repeated phrase we are often asked shows that peter was considering all the questions and opinions of his age on the points in question and attempting to harmonize them on the whole he succeeds in remaining rigorously orthodox but there was opposition to some of his views during his lifetime and after the third council of the lateran in 1179 however began one canon with we believe with peter abelard in the thirteenth century the masters of paris condemned several propositions which have since been published at the end of the book the lombard's rather vaguely stated conclusions were an advantage to the book when used as a text in the schools for it encouraged questions and comments on it by both masters and students the first book of the sentences discusses the trinity the second the creation and the fall the third the incarnation and the last the sacraments and eschatology it is of course his discussion of sacraments which here concern us here much work had already been done by the theologians of the period and peter entered into their labors in his sentences robert pullus the first english cardinal had given four of his eight books to a discussion of the sacraments but his work was not systematically arranged and a very slight comparison with peter's shows what an advance the latter had made his advance however was only possible by the help of the cardinal's work in the theologia of abelard as in the books of sentences by his followers the sacraments had been discussed at length in the sick at non too questions relating to the sacraments had been raised and both these had a marked influence on peter's fourth book hugh of st victor's last work before his death in eleven forty one was de sacramentis fidei much of this had been taken over word for word by the summa sententiarum which quite certainly was not by hugh but comes from his school originally it had no tractates on the last things on orders or on marriage the tractate on orders was taken from ivo of chartres that on marriage from walter of martigues but these had been added to the other tractates before the lombard study of the books for he made use of them both fournier has made it certain that gratian's decretum was written before peter lombard's sentences and it is then quite clear that it was one of the sources for peter's discussion of the sacraments from the decretum and from abelard's secat non peter took the citations from patristic literature as authorities for his argument the lombard transcribes literally passages from hugh's de sacramentis or from the summa and adds citations of authorities which he took from gratian today such methods would lay him open immediately to the charge of plagiarism but in the middle ages this was a correct literary method passages from the fathers are given under their own names at least to the best of his knowledge of them but those from works of his contemporaries quite anonymously end of peter lombard and the sacramental system excerpt by elizabeth francis rogers eighteen ninety two to nineteen seventy four published in 1917.